Okay, um, welcome back to Sally or Science as a Lifestyle for Youth. Um, this is the last lesson uh, for this summer. And today we will be learning about the science of summer. So first we'll just talk about um, what causes the seasons and specifically summer. And then we'll talk about some summery things like uh, sweat and sunburn and the signs behind that. And then we'll learn about how summer affects ecology, how summer affects animal behavior, their migration patterns, their behavioral patterns, and things like that. And then finally, we'll talk about the science of your summer. So the science behind a lot of the summer activities that you guys just typed in the chat. Um, and then we'll go and do a Kahoot. And this Kahoot will be um, comprehensive of everything we learned this summer. So there'll be stuff about corals, bison, dinosaurs, and uh, today's lesson in this Kahoot. And then um, I'm not sure if we'll have time to watch some wacky science videos, um, but then at the end, we'll wrap up and have um, an ending message and just kind of wrap up the summer session. Um, okay, so uh, now I, Sean will present, and my brother Sean, who is a, currently going to um, University of California at Berkeley, he's going to be talking a little bit about the science behind summer. So why don't you get into that, Sean? Okay, um, hi. So we're going to be talking about a lot of summer things today. And I think a good thing to start off with is to talk about why we have summer. So why do we have summer? Um, a lot of people think it might be because of the Earth's rotation around or orbit around the sun. Because our, as you might know, like the Earth doesn't rotate like in a perfect circle around the sun, but rather it's a little bit elliptical or kind of like oval shaped. Um, however, like the difference between like the oval shape and the circle shape when you talk about like space is like very, very small. So it's not enough to uh, it's not enough to affect the Earth's like temperature enough so that we have summer. So if like the uh, orbit around the sun isn't enough to like cause summer, what does cause summer? Um, okay, wait. Next slide. Okay. So the actual reason is that summer is uh, happens to be because of like the tilt. So Earth's axis, the axis is like the basically the straight line up and down the Earth. Like it's tilted a little bit. And because of this tilt, one part of the Earth is actually facing a little bit closer to the sun than the other half. And because of this like tilt, that's why we have the different seasons. Um, as you can see in this picture, the various degrees of tilt and the different locations uh, causes the different seasons. Um, however, like if you can see the top of the Earth, which is like the northern hemisphere and like the bottom of the Earth, which is like the southern hemisphere, when it's tilted, the northern hemisphere is facing towards the sun and then the southern hemisphere is like facing away from the sun. So this means that actually when the northern hemisphere has summer, the southern hemisphere has the opposite because it's tilted away from the sun. So to demonstrate this a little bit more, we're going to watch a quick video. Um, let me make sure I'm sharing computer sound. Spring is here! Now, instead of building snow forts and licking icicles, we can skateboard and ride our bikes and we don't have to worry about squeaks getting rusty in the snow. Speaking of seasons, you know we have four of them, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, but do you know why? We have more than one season? Well, we have seasons because the Earth is tilted. Instead of standing straight up and down, it leans a little bit. Whoa, how'd that happen? A really, really long time ago, billions of years ago, scientists think something big hit the Earth. The impact was so strong that it knocked our planet over a little bit. So now Earth is tilted. And our tilted planet travels around the sun, completing one full trip all the way around every year. I mean, that's what a year is, the time it takes for the Earth to go around the sun once. And depending on where the Earth is in its journey around the sun, our exposure to sunlight changes. That means the seasons change. That's why we have four seasons in one year. Sometimes during the year, part of the Earth tilts toward the sun. Sometimes it tilts away from the sun. When the part of the planet you're on is tilted toward the sun, it's, you guessed it, summer. When it's tilted away from the sun, it's, yep, 
winter. And when it's in between, well, the weather's pretty much in between too. That's when we have spring and autumn. They're both a little bit warm and a little bit cool and often windy. But if the season also depends on where on earth you happen to live, that means that not everyone experiences the same season at the same time. It can be summer in some parts of the world when it's winter in others because those different parts of the planet are getting different amounts of sunlight. When the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun in the summertime, the southern hemisphere is tilted away. So it's winter time there. So the tilting of our planet explains a lot. It's why we have seasons and why it's not always winter or always summer all of the time. And it also helps us understand why different parts of the world can experience different seasons at the same time. Thanks for watching, guys. Enjoy your season, whatever it happens to be. See you next time. Um, sorry, one second. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, oh, whoops. All right. Okay. So then one thing, oh, okay. I'm not sure. All right. Okay. So during this presentation, we're also going to be doing some polls and we're going to see if you guys like can guess the correct answers. So let me send out this poll. So can you guys vote and see how many, like, how much ice cream do you guys think are eaten by, like, Americans during the summer? Um, can you see the poll if I have it on the screen? Um, I can't see it because I'm a co-host, but I believe they can see it. it All right, I'm on my screen share. Uh, no. Okay. So just give a little bit more time. All right, so let me share the results of the poll that you guys have. Uh, so a lot of you guys thought that um, Americans eat 1.5 billion gallons of ice cream, which is a lot. Um, and that's pretty close. 1.5 billion gallons of ice cream is actually the amount that Americans eat during the entire year. So during the summer, uh, 800 million gallons of ice cream are actually eaten. And this is just because during the summer, people want to eat ice cream more. Okay, so we'll keep moving. So the effect of latitude. So if you don't know, the difference between latitude and longitude is latitude are the lines that go like up and down. So they are, I guess they go horizontally or stretched around. There's something that people always say is like latitude, fatitude, which is like around like the waist sort of thing. So, uh, so the lines of latitude go from the equator, which is the like middle of the earth, and they go up and down. So one thing with latitude is that it kind of like, helps dictate like where the earth is like in um so we earlier we talked about like the earth's tilt so using latitude lines it kind of like gives us an idea of um how close to that middle of the tilt are we from um the equator which is the center so what you can see here is different biomes and climate so the different biomes are just like the different environmental like conditions such as like rainfall uh temperature weather that sort of thing um, and the different colors are present like are if they're the same color, they're like the same biome. So if you can see like with the lines, the ones that are on the same lines tend to have the same biome. For example, like the middle, the equator, the line that's like completely solid. If you look around like the map of the planet, you can see a lot of the green areas are uh, in the same like area. And if you look higher up, if you see like the gray areas, they're also in the same like line area or the same latitude. Now, what's interesting is you can also see that because the equator is the center or the middle, uh, if you look up and down, for example, if you look up one line, you can see a bunch of like the gray area. But if you also look down one line, you can see areas with gray on it too. This is just because like the earth is symmetrical in its biomes. So if you look at the same latitude, uh, you'll often find that they have the same like climate. Now, if you're wondering like why this is, is because we were talking about earlier, um, the amount of tilt uh, basically tells us like how much sunlight a part of the earth receives during a part of the year. 
And sunlight is very important because it can dictate everything from like what kind of plants can grow there, what kind of animals can live there, and then the temperature. And the temperature also can affect like weather, like how much rainfall there is. So that's why understanding like uh, where you are on the planet is important when you're trying to figure out like, what kind of um, climate you're going to have. So now we're going to talk about another summer topic, which is sweat. So sweat is something that we all do, but not all animals do it. Uh, actually, um, human, humans and like primates, like monkeys and gorillas, are one of the only animals that like sweat a lot. But why do we sweat? It's like to regulate our temperature, because if our body gets too hot, then it's not good. It's not very healthy. Our body likes to um, stay pretty much the same temperature as much as it can. So when it gets hot outside, how can we keep ourselves cool? One way is through sweat. And like, how does it cool? So sweat is kind of like mostly made of water with some material, um, some like salts and minerals. So what happens is like the salts, when it comes out of these like sweat glands, they come to the top of your skin. And at the top of your skin, the sweat can kind of evaporate. Just like, you know, sometimes you might splash like cold water on yourself if you're trying to cool down. The sweat does a pretty similar thing. When the water is like on your skin, it like, allows heat to escape a little bit more fast than if just like air was blowing on it. So um, that's how sweat cools down your body. Now, how much can you sweat? The a maximum amount a human can sweat during like a day is like three liters, but that's only in like very, um, very hot conditions and also very like dry conditions. And now if we're looking at how effective is sweat and in what conditions, well, sweat or water can actually like cool you down seven times faster than if you were just like, you know, using a fan and it was very dry. And the problem is though, sometimes the outside air is a little too wet. And so then your body doesn't like evaporate as much sweat. So then you actually feel a lot cooler when it's dry and hot than when it's like really humid and hot. Because if it's really humid, there's already a lot of water in the air. So the water can't really leave your skin that well because it's already pretty crowded in the air. So, and then we already kind of talked about what's in it, but for sweat, it's mostly made of water. It's actually 99% water with just a little bit of like other things such as like salt and minerals. And hopefully none of you guys have experienced this this summer, but another thing that people talk about in the summer is sunburn. So one thing is sunburn is only due to a very specific kind of light. And that light is ultraviolet or UV. And the reason, oh, sorry, there is a phone call, so that's a little loud. Um, so just, sorry, ignore that. But um, So what kind of light and why? So we talked about that as UV ultraviolet light. And why doesn't like regular light affect us, like the light that we see with our eyes? And the reason why is because there's something called the light spectrum. And that's the picture on the top right hand corner. Over here, there's a light spectrum, and then the difference between the different kinds of light is like these different waves, right? So light can travel similar to a wave, and then how fast or how frequent it like um, goes up and down can tell you a lot about its like energy and its wavelength. So actually, the faster that a light wave goes like up and down, um, or the closer the peaks are, that's like the higher the frequency, and the higher the frequency, the more like powerful uh, light can be. So if you look on our scale here, visible light is on the right hand side of ultraviolet, which means that ultraviolet um, is a little bit more powerful than visible light. And that's why ultraviolet has the power to like damage your skin, but regular light doesn't. So why does your skin turn red when you have a sunburn? You know, your skin turns red because uh, when, you're, when this UV light penetrates into your skin, it can damage some of your tissue, right? It can cause, um, it can cause inflammation. And inflammation, or when you get like a little red and swollen skin, is just because your blood vessels start to become bigger to try to get more blood into the areas. Because a lot of times your body heals different wounds and different scratches by pumping blood into the area because the blood has things like white blood cells that help like fight off infection and helps like repair your skin. So how do damaged cells respond? Like there are two different ways that damaged cells can respond. One, they like purposefully kind of, um, they die because they want to get out of the way so healthy cells can come and replace them. So this is why when you have sunburn, sometimes you can have like, you know, flaky skin afterwards. And then um, another way your damaged cells can respond is by getting very tan. 
So that's why people in the summer when they're outside a lot can get kind of tan is because their bodies are producing a chemical and it's called melanin, but that's not really that important. What's important is what melanin does is it helps you like shield from the UV rays a little bit better. It helps absorb it without letting it damage like deeper down in your skin. So how does sunscreen work? Sunscreen basically works by acting as like a shield. So this shield can bounce off UV rays or it can absorb it. What the purpose of sunscreen is, is just to stop it from getting into the lower layers because the lower layers are what actually causes the damage like that um, it's not good for your body. So when we're talking about sunburn, and I'm sure your parents have talked to you a lot about like the importance of putting on sunscreen. The reason why is because there are two major dangers of sunburn. One is like the pretty typical one. It hurts, right? Like you can, when you get sunburn, you get like red skin, it can get blisters. And this is just because of the inflammation that we talked about earlier. The swollenness that comes from when the UV light, the really powerful light kind of damages your skin underneath. Now, there's also another kind of damage. And this one is a little bit less um, clear just because the other kind is DNA damage. Because of the energy of the light, sometimes it can even penetrate your cells and mess up the DNA in it, leading to things such as skin cancer. So that's why it's like very important that you guys like use sunscreen. So we're going to do our second um, summer numbers. And let me put out the poll. All right. So how many people do you guys think visit Disney in the summer? Is it 100 million? 996,000? Is it seven people? 39 million? 84 million or 13 million? We'll just give it a little bit more time for you guys to put in your votes. And remember, this is also anonymous, so you don't have to worry about that. Just try your best. You can end the poll. Yeah. All right. So a lot of you guys thought it was 84 million, but actually the correct answer is 39 million. Um, each, each month, like during the summer, uh, Disney gets about 13 million visitors. So over the course of the three months of summer, there's approximately 39 million people who visit Disney each summer, which is really quite a lot. Hopefully there's not that many people this summer because of, you know, the reason of like we have a pandemic going on, but hopefully that will become better soon. So now we're going to go to my brother and he's going to continue the presentation. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Um, okay. So let me unpin your video. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so now we will be talking a little bit about the effect of summer on ecology and specifically on animals. So first, how does summer affect the food patterns for animals? So as Sean talked about, in the summer, we have longer days due to the Earth's tilt. We're exposed to more sunlight. And what we learned in past lessons is that uh, the food chain starts from sunlight. Sunlight is the source of energy of all life on Earth. So sunlight causes more, oh, sorry. <laughs> sunlight causes more plant growth because plant gro plants, um, as you all know, through photosynthesis, take sunlight to create energy. So more sunlight equals more plant growth. And oh, what are those? Um, Sean, can you get rid of the annotations? Okay. Um, please do not annotate on the screen. Thank you. All right. Okay. So more sunlight equals more plant growth and more plant growth means more food for herbivores, which are organisms that eat plants. And then more herbivores mean more foods for carnivores. And carnivores are organisms that eat other organisms like herbivores or um, 
uh, other animals, right? So all because there's more sunlight, it causes more food and more opportunity all the way up the food chain. So um, if you remember the food chain vi uh, video and lesson, uh, this just increasing sunlight can affect the entire food chain. So some more effects of animals are animals usually breed in the spring. So offspring, um, the baby animals are born in the spring, which means they're raised during the summer. And the reason why they're raised during the summer is that the summer is warmer months. So the offspring are more easily kept warm. Otherwise, the offspring can have trouble um, keeping warm and surviving. And also, as we mentioned in the last slide, there's more food. So this is able to accommodate um, the extra food that's needed to feed the baby animals and the offspring, right? So that's why a lot of animals are raised during the uh, summer. And then also, because there's a lot more sunlight, um, there's more competition for the sunlight. And this is especially shown in tropical rainforests. As you all, uh, if you think of tropical rainforests, you think of um, these areas that are filled with plants, absolutely completely covered in greenery, right? And the reason for this is that these plants are competing for the abundance of sunlight, which is why trees and plants try to grow taller and wider and cover more surface area because they're competing for the food uh, and for sunlight. Um, so do you guys have any questions about this? Okay, if we don't have any questions, we'll move on. Um, okay, so now we will talk about the effect on animals because of the summer weather. So because the summer, in the summer, there's more sunlight, um, it, it can cause droughts and a lack of water in a lot of desert and drier regions. Um, and this is because uh, the sunlight evaporates water, right? And so um, because of the uh, decrease in water, this causes green plants to turn brown in a lot of desert regions. Um, and the reason they turn brown is that they want to go into a dormant state and conserve energy and water. Because if they didn't uh, turn brown and turn into a dormant state, a lot of their water and energy would be taken away by the sunlight because sun evaporates that water and it's a lot harder for these plants to keep the water um, in the plant because the sunlight would try to evaporate the water out of the plant. So this is kind of like how trees lose their leaves in winter and go into a dormant state because in the winter there's less sunlight so the trees aren't really getting that much benefit from trying to do photosynthesis and they're actually losing energy so that's why a lot of green plants start to turn brown um and then um and then because of the drier conditions in these desert regions a lot of plants have adaptations to deal with this and have evolved to uh, survive in times when there's less water. So one example of this is the laurel sumac plant. And so this plant, as you can see below, the shape of its leaves are kind of like a taco shell, right? Like um, a corn tortilla taco shell. <laughs> so it's kind of curved. And the reason why it's curved is so it can have less surface area exposed to the sun. Because the more of the plant is exposed to the sun means the more sunlight is evaporating the water and the plant wants to hold on to that water. So it wants to reduce the area of the plant that's exposed to the sun. That's why it's curved like this rather than completely flat. And also it's curved like a, like a taco shell um, because it also causes dew and rainwater to drip down into the roots. And it's kind of so it kind of serves like a slide or like a funnel. So any water that lands on the leaf is slided down the leaf and falls to the soil below the plant, which is where the roots are. Okay, so do you guys have any questions about this? 
Um, so someone asked, so the plant doesn't die and they store water. Um, so it's kind of like trees in the winter. Um, the plant doesn't die. It just goes into a dormant state, which means it's not really doing anything. It's kind of just, you know, being there. Um, it's kind of like how bears hibernate during the winter. The bears don't die. They're just, they just aren't doing anything. Um, and the name of this plant is the laurel sumac plant. Okay, so some other effects of the w weather is that because it's hotter and, um, and it, these animals want to save energy. And if you've ever been outside on a very hot day, it, sometimes, it makes you very tired and it uses a lot of energy just, just to be outside because your body is constantly trying to cool down and constantly trying to um, keep a lower temperature. Um, and this can take a lot of energy. Just being outside when there's a lot of heat and when it's very hot takes a lot of energy. So that's why a lot of animals like to burrow underground during the summer in order to save energy. And then, um, but not all animals do this. Um, some animals like the garter stakes, the, the garter stakes, um, during the summer, they actually like to come out and they enjoy the heat because they're reptiles and they actually um, don't create their own warmth. Reptiles or cold blooded animals um, use the heat from their environment, like the sun, to warm themselves up. So that's why snakes, unlike humans, they like to be outside during the summer because they like to soak up the energy from the sun because they can't produce their own uh, heat for themselves. And um, that's why they come out during the summer and they hibernate during the winter. And then also during the summer, um, if you didn't know in like a lot of like Southeast Asian regions um, like India or um, the Southern Pacific or <laughs> the Southeast Pacific region, they have a monsoon season. So if you don't know what a monsoon is, um, it's kind of like a tropical hurricane, right? So it's kind of like um, a time where there's a lot of rain and a lot of wind. Um, but basically, it's just a time where it's more humid, there's more water, and this allows desert regions to have a burst of activity and light. So during the mon uh, burst of activity and life, um, so during the monsoon season, there's a lot more species that come out of hibernation and a lot more species are more active and there's uh, more plants and animals everywhere. So there's also an effect on animals um, with their appearance. Um, a lot of animals, especially in the Arctic regions, they have different fur colors due to the different seasons. So in the darker uh, in the summer months, they'll have a darker fur color. And then in the winter months, they'll have a lighter winter, uh, lighter fur color. And this is due to several reasons. Um, one reason is that it helps these animals blend in to their environment and have camouflage. Um, so I'll show some of these pictures. Okay, so as you can see, um, this is the ermine. So in the winter, it has a white coat. And then in the summer, it has a darker coat. And then also with the Arctic foxes, in the winter, they have a white coat. And in the summer, they have a darker coat. And then there's a lot of examples of this, like the, um, like the Arctic hare, right? And even birds. Okay. All right. Um, and then finally, um, the effect on animals is also it change the summer changes their migration patterns so in the summer a lot of birds migrate to the northern hemisphere where the temperatures are warmer and then also many other animals like leopard sharks blue whales free-tailed bats and walruses all move to warmer waters and areas where there's abundance of food to have feeding grounds during the summer months so blue whales will do thousands of miles of migrations. Um, on the right, these are leopard sharks. They go to, they migrate to um, warmer waters um, near Mexico uh, and like San Diego, that region. 
um, they migrate there during the winter, uh, the summer months. So during the summer, it affects a lot of animals' migration patterns too. Okay, um, so we have another trivia, small numbers number three. So uh, how many people grill on the 4th of July? Uh, Sean, could you put up that poll? Okay, is it 8%, 61%, 34%, or 83%? Um, maybe, <laughs> I don't know how many of you grilled during the 4th of July, but it's pretty popular. Um, okay, Sean, you can end the poll. All right, so um, I don't know the right the, answer. The answer is 61% <laughs> of Americans okay, grill so it's, on the 4th of July. <laughs> so more than half of all Americans grill during the 4th of July. That's um, just a quick summer fact. Okay, so just to sum up what we've learned, um, it's, it kind of shows you the complexity of nature and how a lot of things are determined by something that seems relatively insignificant. For example, all the things we talked about relating to summer is all because the earth is a little bit tilted. Just because the earth is a little bit tilted, this causes the seasons. This causes more, flu, more food, more abundance of life. Just because the earth has a little bit of tilt, this causes animal migration patterns. This causes blue whales to travel thousands of miles. Just because the earth has a little tilt, this causes animals to change the color of their fur. This, causes, this influences animals to breed during the spring and raise their offspring during the summer. Just because the earth has a little bit of tilt, this causes so many different things. And this just shows you the complexity of the earth and nature and how one little thing about the earth can affect so many things. And this is a very common theme in science. Oftentimes, just because one small thing is like this, this causes so many other things to be the way they are. Okay. Um, and most importantly, summer gives you summer break. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have school. Okay, and now we're just going to talk a little bit about the science of your summer. So these might be some activities that you guys do during the summer. Um, like, first of all, hiking in the forest. Um, some scientific papers have shown that spending time just, you know, wandering around in the forest, maybe a forest preserve or... Um, you know, like a national park or state park, just spending time in the forest can improve your health by boosting your immune system. And your immune system is how well you can fight off um, different bacteria or um, organisms that cause you to be sick. So it boosts your immune, immune system and it helps lower your blood pressure and helps you be more relaxed and um, at peace. Um, and this is due to a lot of reasons, um, better air quality when you're outside, um, just being away from all electronics and distractions can help, you know, relax you and be at peace with nature. Um, and a lot of other reasons too, but this just shows you that you should spend time outside, even though um, you can't go to a lot of public areas, you know, go to the park, um, have a little socially distanced um, fun in nature because it can be really helpful to your health. And then also, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of my childhood, I spent chasing around fireflies, which are like the lightning bugs that um, at night they glow up. Um, so fireflies, they actually hibernate for most of the year and they come out during the summer. And the reason why they glow and they have bioluminescence is um, to warn predators to not eat me. And predators, when they see this organism that's glowing, these predators like bats know that these fireflies don't taste good. And that's why the bats won't eat the fireflies. Um, and then also a lot of you, when you go to the beach, you might do some sunbathing. And kind of like what Sean was talking about, the UV rays from the sun can damage our cells, um, but our skin actually produces a melanin pigment and melanin causes your skin to become darker to absorb the UV rays. 
But the melanin pigment actually has a 48 hour cycle. So when you're going out in the sun for long times, day after day after day, this can cause your skin to not be able to produce enough melanin. So the UV rays actually enter your skin and can cause damage and even skin cancer. So this is why it's important to wear sunscreen and wear layers of uh, clo wear clothing that covers up your skin and not to go outside for too long each day. And then also, finally, we have a quick video about how sand is made. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for that. So maybe at the end, if we have time, we'll watch that. Um, but now we'll just do a, a Kahoot wrap up. So remember, this is going to be a Kahoot. Um, just talking about everything that we learned um, during this summer session. Okay, so could everyone, okay, so could everyone please um, and go to kahoot.it in your web browser and enter the game pin as shown here, 826-6094. And then um, you can use your, like a fake name, please. Um, make it appropriate though. Uh, you can use your like first name if you want to, but um, I encourage you to make like uh, like a fake name, like a fun fake name, but make sure it's appropriate or else I will kick you out. <laughs> Feisty Felicia, okay. <laughs> Okay, so we'll just wait for people to join. Uh, you can let us know if, uh, type in the chat if you have any issues. We have Dracula, <laughs> Kabuki. Okay, we're still waiting for um, six other people to join. We'll start in a few, like one or two more minutes. I eat trees. Interesting. I feel like I might know who, who that is. <laughs> Thank you, Lena, for sending the link. Okay, it seems like most people are here. Um, so I will type in the chat the game pin so you can join later. Um, but for now, we will get started. Oh, sorry, I sent it to one person. Uh, one second. <laughs> Okay, so that's a game pin, so you can join later. Um, but we will get started now. Uh... Oh, there it is. Okay. So these will be questions that from anything that we've learned this summer. So first of all, which of these is the biggest herbivore? So this is a dinosaur question. Okay, sorry, it's moving a little fast. Um, but the answer is a Brachiosaurus. Um, here, let me, let me pull up a picture actually. So this is what the Brachiosaurus looks like. So it's um, uh, quite a large animal. All right, next question. So good job to these people. Okay, true or false? The T-Rex is the largest meat-eating land animal ever. Oh, 
Okay, the answer is true. Okay, good job. Okay, what was the heaviest dinosaur ever? Okay, so the answer is the Argentinosaur. What is the weight of the heaviest wild bison on record? Okay, the answer is 2,800 pounds. What do you call a bison and a cow mix? So a mix of a bison and a cow. <laughs> okay, the answer is a cattleope or a beefalo, um, <laughs> which are, you know, made up names, but I think they're pretty funny. <laughs> okay, what was the peak of bison populations? Okay, the answer is 30 to 60 million. So nowadays, um, there's less than a million. I believe it's like 600,000. So there's a lot less bison now, if you remember from our bison lesson. Okay, good job to these people and everyone else too. So coral reefs are created by what? Okay, so the answer is coral polyps. Um, so corals are actually not one organism, but it's actually a, a colony of these little polyps, if you remember from our coral lesson. Okay, feisty Felicia. Very impressive. Coral reefs are home to crabs, shrimps, fish, or all of them. Okay, the answer is all of these. Um, coral reefs are often called um, the rainforests of the ocean or of the, of the sea um, because they have a lot of diversity of life. They have crabs, shrimps, fish, and more organisms. They're one of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. Okay, reefs grow in. So reefs grow in warm water. So kind of like this lesson, how we were talking about um, the summer being warmer allows a lot more organisms to flourish and warmer temperatures allow a lot more life to thrive. So this is the reason why reefs are um, mostly in warm waters because it allows so many different organisms to thrive. Okay. Okay, are corals animals or plants? So the answer is they're actually animals. Um, corals, by them, the polyps by themselves don't produce their own energy through photosynthesis. What they actually do is they have a symbiotic relationship with algae. And algae are able to perform photosynthesis to, pr to produce their own energy. So they have a, mut a mutualistic relationship between coral polyps and algae. Um, and this connects to our symbiotic relationships lesson, if you remember. That was one of our first lessons. Okay, what gives coral its color? Okay, so the answer is algae. I kind of gave you a hint in the, from the last question. 
Um, but coral polyps have algae inside of them and algae come in all sorts of different colors. So that's why corals come in so many colors. Okay. What is commensalism? This is a symbiotic relationship. So what is commensalism? So commensalism is where one organism benefits and the other is not affected. So oxpeckers feed on ticks found on rhinos. Ticks feed on rhinos. What symbiotic relationship is this? So the answer is that this is mutualism. And mutualism is where both organisms benefit. So the ticks feed on the rhinoceros. So the ticks are bad for the rhinos. So the oxpeckers take away those ticks that are harmful to the rhinos. So that's how the oxpeckers help the rhinos. And the rhinos help the oxpeckers because they provide the oxpeckers with food, which are the ticks. So this is beneficial for both organisms. So remember, commensalism is where one organism is not affected at all, but in this case, both benefit. So it's not commensalism. And then predation is where one organism hunts and kills the other. And then parasitism is where one organism benefits while the other one is actually harmed. Okay, science is amazing and fun. So this is a very hard question. Um, there's a lot of different choices. Um, so the answer is um, yes, 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 and no, but only no on opposite day, which means yes. Okay, so in third place, we have, um, okay, um, in second place, uh, we have that. Um, and in first place, we have Feisty Felicia. Um, but good job to all of you. Um, uh, it's okay if you didn't get every question right. It was just for fun. And if you learned even one thing, that makes it worth it. As long as you learn something. Okay. So back to the slides. Um, so as... You guys might know, um, this is the last lesson for this summer. Um, so from this summer, we learned a lot of things. Um, in the beginning, we learned about ecology, symbiotic relationships, food chains, food webs. Then we learned about a lot of fun things like corals, chemistry, bison, dinosaurs. You created your own animals. And today we learned about the science of summer. So we learned a lot of things from a lot of different areas. Um, and a lot of these things aren't things that are, are things that you probably uh, don't learn a lot in school. So um, that was my goal. Um, and some takeaways that I hope you learned from this summer is that, first of all, science is amazing. Science is so complex and intricate and um, affects us in so many different ways. And learning about science can open up so many possibilities and help you understand the world around you. And science is so diverse. We learned about so many different fields of science, and we barely scratched the surface of how many different areas of science there are, from chemistry, physics, biology, ecology, um, corals, bison. Science is everywhere. And um, the more science you learn, is gives you a better understanding of the world and what's in the world, um, the reason why things the way they are, and how are things um, hap or how are things uh, performed, and how are things happening around the world. So that's why I think it's so important for all of you to learn science, and that's because it helps you understand the world around you and be able to appreciate it more. And then also, we learned that collaboration and science go hand in hand. 
And we learned this in the create your own animals presentation, um, where all of you had to work together to um, create your own animals. And this is a common theme in the field of science. Um, as you'll see in lab groups or when you're working and doing experiments, oftentimes you're gonna have to work with other people and collaborate with the people around you. So collaboration is a very important skill. So hopefully you guys improved and worked on that a little bit through this Sally classes. And then also, um, Hopefully you guys learned the importance of curiosity and learning about what interests you and you know, exploring and spending your free time just learning about random things. Um, you guys might think that a lot of these lessons were just about random topics and that's true. Um, I just created these lessons based off what I found that were, what I found to be interesting. Um, like I find bison and coral to be very interesting topics so I decided to teach about that. And I encourage all of you to have that same mindset, to just follow your curiosity and learn about whatever interests you, no matter, about, no matter if that's something you learn in school, no matter if um, that's something um, that's a part of your curriculum or your homework, no matter what, just follow your curiosity and learn about what interests you. And then finally, I hope all of you learned that science is fun. Um, and it can be a very interesting and fun thing, especially when you're working with people, when you're playing Kahoot games with people, when you're watching fun videos, or even when you're just learning about a cool new species. Science is a really fun thing. And it's something that you guys shouldn't see as boring, but something that can be very interesting and fun. And based off all these takeaways, um, hopefully, I, you guys have learned that science is a lifestyle. That's why um, this club is called SALLY, which stands for Science as a Lifestyle for Youth. Because I believe that science is a lifestyle, that when you learn how to think about things scientifically, when you learn more about science, you get a better understanding of the world around you. The more you learn about science, you start looking at things differently. When you go outside and feel a sun on your skin, you start thinking about the science behind it. Maybe when you go to the beach and um, see different organisms interacting, you think about science. Maybe if you take a trip to the forest or your uh, local park, you can see the different symbiotic relationships between organisms. You can understand the food chain. And hopefully science gives you a new perspective on life. So, um, I also just want to thank you all. Um, doing these lessons have really uh, made my day and seeing all of you have fun and smile during the games um, really brightened my days and really gave me encouragement and motivation um, and really gives me a passion for science. Um, all of you are very smart and very bright kids um, and you make me very excited and hopeful for the future of science because I know all of you um, will be very smart and successful in the field of science. Even though if your career isn't in science, um, I know that all of you are a part of the future of science. Um, just by learning about science and understanding the world around you and appreciating it makes you a part of the future of science. So I encourage you all to continue to pursue science and learn about things that interest you. Um, and so just to talk a little bit about the future of these Sally lessons, um, uh, type in the chat if you want these lessons to continue in the future. Um, type yes or no in the chat. Um, seems like a lot of people are uh, saying yes, which is a good thing. Um, so I plan to continue these lessons during the school year. Um, after today's lesson, I'll take a little bit of a break before we start the next session. Um, and the specific schedule and plan of these future lessons are still to be determined, but I'll continue to communicate with your parents and let you guys know my plan when I uh, decide on it. And in the future, there's so many more things that I wanna teach you guys. I wanna teach you guys 
how to research the topics you're interested, how to do the scientific method. And the scientific method is what you do when you perform experiments. So in the future, hopefully we can do some easy um, at home experiments and have fun doing that. And then I hope to teach a lot more wacky, random, interesting topics in science. Um, so hopefully you guys all had fun. Um, and thank you all again for coming today and coming to these lessons over the summer. It means a lot to me. And um, just keep pursuing science and have fun with it. Um, and that is all I have for you today. Um, so thank you for coming out and have a great rest of your summer and have a great start to your school year. Thank you.